Paul McKenna is a man with a mission. He's out to prove there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Often going against perceived medical wisdom, Paul believes that the mind has a limitless capacity to reprogram itself. In short, he believes he can change your life. You've got to reprogram your mind. Tonight, he treats Celia, a former doctor who spent £100,000 on therapy trying to cure her needle phobia. I was helping patients' lives at risk. He takes on a challenging case of Tourette syndrome in Matthew. <laughs> and can he cure Lizzie, who two years on still thinks about her ex-lover every two minutes? I want to be so free from thinking about this man. I'm obsessed by him. Human mind's like a computer. It has programs that it runs that enable us to do, well, everything that it is that we're able to. So when someone has a problem, I can help them reprogram themselves. Now, these people have been told that they're incurable. We'll see about that, because I'm going to put my reputation on the line, and I believe, if, even if I can't cure them, I can significantly change their lives for the better. World-renowned for his hypnotic powers, Paul will use the very latest and somewhat controversial methods to treat tonight's case studies. Stress control will be key to tackling Matt's Tourette's. Tell me how you felt when you were doing that. Visualization techniques are the main focus of removing Lizzie's love pain. Collapse the old addiction out. But Paul will need to call upon all his years of experience if he's going to cure our first case. Celia Batley lives in South London. She qualified as a doctor in 1991 and was totally committed to her job. Initially the hours were horrendous. Uh, I, think, I remember one week I worked 140 hours. You got the feeling with Celia that she was doing medicine for the right reasons. She really enjoyed doing it, she really enjoyed helping people and she was very ambitious with it as well. She had a great career ahead of her. And we have to bear in mind that somebody who then loses that loses an enormous amount. But then Celia's life changed forever. Whilst working on a ward with HIV patients, she was pricked by a used needle. The day I had the needle stick injury, I was uh, doing a surgical job. We just finished the ward round, and I was doing some discharge letters for some of the patients. I needed to check the dose of a, one of the drugs I was giving a patient, so I went to the drugs trolley, bent down to pick up the BNF, which is the book that has all the drugs in and I just felt this prick on my thumb and I looked down and there was this green needle just lying there. What happened next was the catalyst for Celia's phobia. You know, the risk factors kept running through my head and it just it started to eat away at me, basically. Over a period of probably two years, that expanded round to sharper, sharper, any sharp objects. In fact, it could even be a safety razor in a bathroom. She couldn't go into the bathroom. Had the test, had to wait about a week, I think, for the results in those days. And again, in that time, was, my head was just all over the place. I was just not sleeping, crying a lot. Although the HIV test was negative, it was the beginning of the end for her medical career. The last night I worked, last night I was on call, I was asked to see someone that was for palliative care only, only so someone that was actually dying and he was having breathing problems and I just couldn't go anywhere near him or the bed and from the end of the bed I just told the nurses to give him something to make him comfortable but if he'd been for active treatment I couldn't have gone near him and that's when I realised that I just couldn't go on, I couldn't do this anymore, that I was... I, I was now putting patients' lives at risk. With Celia's career in ruins, the British Medical Association sued the hospital on her behalf. After a lengthy legal battle, a final settlement was agreed. The media got hold of the story and painted me in a very bad light. They didn't really have the facts. There was a journalist from a Sunday tabloid um, doorstepping her to tell her that the next day they were going to run a story about her and that was it, she was in floods of tears, completely distraught, it completely freaked her out. I actually got quite suicidal because I could not believe what I'd become, how my life had changed so much. For ten years Celia's avoided medical environments. This is the first time she's stepped into a room with needles since the accident. 
straight away I just see that there's a shark's fin, so I assume that blood has been taken in here, so I automatically assume that there are needles that have not been disposed of correctly, so I'm feeling anxious, and to be honest, I don't want to walk any further into the room. I don't actually think about dying, or it's, it's not that sort of, it's not like, it's just that I'm suddenly going to get HIV, and it's such an awful thing. It's, I, can't, I can't accept the fact that today the treatments are very good and your life expectancy is still very good. I just have this fear, I can't, I, sh I can't catch it. I would force myself to go to work, but then I would just rush back home, and, and I, so I stopped going, I was going out less and less socially. For a time she was living in a flat in South London and not venturing outside of the room. She eventually, for a couple of years of her life, effectively became a recluse. The knock-on effect that it had was that, as you know, she could no longer practice medicine. It became impractical for her to go into work. And so at a stroke, her life plan had suddenly changed. Everything she'd wanted to do, everything she'd wanted to be, was suddenly taken away from her. I had a hell of a lot of treatment at the Priory Hospital. And since then, I've had huge amounts of behavioural therapy and psychotherapy and it has helped a bit but the phobia is still there. A hundred thousand pounds of different therapies means Celia can now at least leave her house but still every day her life is blighted by irrational fears. I'm not, it's just it's really hard for me. It makes me feel really uncomfortable. I just want to run away. I just, oh, it's just if I tread on a twig or something, I automatically think that I've trodden on a needle. I haven't really moved on in my life. Everywhere I go, it, it's, it's very much in my mind, and it really holds me back. I mean, there are certain places I just will not go near. I hate going up to central London. I just fear, especially places around Soho, places like that. I've, I've seen needles on the streets there before, so I really fear going up there. just constantly checking because I think there's going to be needles lying around and if there's any rubbish or anything I don't like. I just want to avoid that and I just don't want people to touch me, bump into me so I just want to be able to walk into a clear space and not have to worry about people being too close to me. Even their bags, I don't want their bags to touch me. Celia deserves, you know, the chance to get her life back. She deserves to be the person that she was, not the person that she's become. This phobia is definitely holding back my life and I've, I've tried all the medical conventional treatments and I've spent thousands of pounds over the years. And if there is anything that can be done that I can get back to my medical career, I can start enjoying the sort of relationships I want to be able to and to have the sort of social life that I should to have, then I'll be very grateful. Paul McKenna has read Celia's case notes and is excited by the prospect of meeting her. He hopes to rid Celia's life of fear, and specifically, her needle phobia. I've had these before, uh, where people have, um, where they're basically overprotecting themselves. It's, it's, it's like a phobia, but it's really a hypochondria. When I see her, I'm going to desensitize uh, the, the, the phobic responses, the, the usual, the, the triggers. But what I'm also going to do is I'm going to ask her unconscious mind to reprogram her so that she keeps all of her abilities to protect herself from diseases but she doesn't over protect. I'll definitely work with her. I know I can, I can absolutely help this person and I, I think I can cure them too. Today could mark the end of a long line of treatments for Celia. Having exhausted all conventional methods of therapy, Paul really is her last hope. Come in, have a seat. Thanks. So, if your life was the way you wanted it to be, how would it be? I would be working, probably still as a doctor, yeah. and I might well be a consultant by now in, yeah. in medical oncology, which is what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, ho hopefully be in, a, be in a relationship, maybe mm. I've had children, because mm. that's something else mm. I fear, mm. the whole actually having a baby. Mm. And then mm. also I've often mm. worried about actually transferring my problem to a mm. child. Yeah. So what we need to do is to remember that things weren't so good, but, but change the response to it, yeah, because at the moment, that's one of the foundations uh, that's holding this phobia together. Because you weren't born phobic of needles, you learned it. Mm -hmm. So if you learned it, you can unlearn it, yeah? Just close your eyes and imagine you're sitting in a cinema, but it's lit so you can see where you are. Float out of your body and into the projection room. Now, imagine the back of your head and the screen in front of that, obviously. Yeah. Yeah? Now, on that screen, we're only going to look at a black and white movie. Mm -hmm. And the movie is of the time when you got scared of, uh, of needles. Mm -hmm. Yeah? 
And so it's not just the actual incident, but it's the fear that, you know, and all the, the, the major moments of trouble have followed. Look at the back of your head, looking up at the screen. Run the movie backwards very fast in black and white now. All the characters are moving backwards. Everyone's talking backwards. Everything's happening backwards in black and white. All the way back to the very beginning. When you're back to the very beginning, just give me a nod and then stop. Okay. We're going to add a new soundtrack to it, and I'd like you to run that movie backwards at twice speed in black and white from inside the movie now. All the characters are moving backwards every... That's right. <laughs> That's it. Make it ludicrous. All the way back to the very beginning. <laughs> when you get back in the beginning, give me a nod. And then run the movie backwards again at twice speed. Now. This treatment may seem bizarre, but by running the images backwards, Paul's telling Celia's brain to recode the memory. Okay. And then run it backwards again at twice speed. Now! The question is, will it work? <laughs> Um, expressions as well. And still to come, Paul takes on a severe case of Tourette's. Do you find that it's worse when you're under oh. stress? And he meets Lizzie, who has an extreme case of a common problem, letting go of an ex-love. Just a vegetable. Dr. Celia Batley has suffered from needle phobia for 10 years, having spent £100,000 on conventional treatment remarkably. After just half an hour with Paul, she can pick up a needle. So let's have a look at that needle now and tell me what the difference is. I just feel a, a bit more comfortable with it. Um, so there's still some anxiety, is there? Even, yeah. even though I know it's clean. Yeah, but how, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much? About 5-ish. Five. See, once you get a phobia under 50%, it's begun generalising in the opposite direction. So even if we left this, you would get better. But I'm not going to do that. I want to really push it today. Now, when you're in hypnosis, it's not like being under an anaesthetic. You know, some people think they won't be able to hear anything or think anything or feel anything. Now, if that happens, you're probably dead. So let me know, <laughs> won't you? Because right? when you're hypnotised, you'll still be able to hear everything I'm saying to you. You will know what's going on. And if for any reason you needed to awaken, like if the room caught fire or something, be able to do so with all your resources yeah so it's like a meditation you'll be aware that I'm here that the camera crew is here you're sitting in this room but all of that will somehow be not as important as becoming fascinated in the daydream that is hypnosis allow your eyes to close shut there you go Paul synchronizes the tempo of his words to the rise and fall of Celia's breathing he then slows the pace of his speech inducing Celia's mind and body to follow taking her into a deep trance. Make them bright and colourful and solid and look down that timeline and know your future's good. Having desensitised the traumatic memory of the accident, Paul's now working to increase her confidence. I want you to reinforce now every positive thought you've ever had about yourself. There you go. So when your hand touches your knee in just a moment, not only will you awaken feeling so refreshed, relaxed and alert, so calm and confident, so filled with optimism, but you'll feel like a burden is lifted. There you go. And you have a happy, confident, productive, spontaneous, wonderful life ahead of you as I count back from 10 to 1, return to normal waking consciousness, feeling really good. 10 nine eight seven six five four three two one Wide Ooh, feel good yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> that's a very nice smile <laughs> you look different you know your whole energy has changed your whole emotional energy about you you seem more relaxed in yourself how do you feel I feel really good. <laughs> okay, where do you want to take this blood from me then? 
I, all I want you really to do, actually I don't want you to take any blood, I just want you to prick my arm, that's what it is. Because, well, because um, all I want you to do is, because that in the past would have been too difficult for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just want you to prove to yourself you can do it, yeah. Oh my god. Is this going to hurt? Sit back and relax yourself. Ah, <laughs> you see, got some bedside manner going now. <laughs> okay. How, how are you feeling? A bit apprehensive. Just prick the surface. That'll do. And take it away. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> You've broken the spell. When was the last time you did that? Probably over ten years ago. Over ten years ago. How do you feel? I'm still a little bit like, oh my god. Oh my god! Just what I did. I know, that's, it's going to take a little time to adjust. You've, you've just undone ten years of programming. So this is where you were earlier. Let's have a little walk down the street. Tell me what's different. I don't feel that I have to look at the ground as much. I just feel freer. I'm not so worried about the crowd swing around me. My word, look at you. Yeah. You're like a different person. So that's it. Yeah, lovely. Just relaxing those shoulders a little more. Imagine like a silver cord holding the back of your head up as you walk down the street. I've never tried anything like that before. And certainly it's got me to a place that I've never, I've never felt this good before. To me, I felt something lifted, a big weight lifted off me. And there's no way I thought I'd ever be able to stick a needle in his arm. And, and he got me to do that. The old spell is broken forever. You can never go back to being as bad as you were ever again. But... Celia's made fantastic progress, but Paul wants to push her one step further, so he's arranged a follow-up treatment in a couple of weeks, when he hopes she will be able to draw blood. Meet 20-year-old Matt from Cambridge. Matt is like any other young man, finding his way in the world. With friends, a passion for dancing, a black belt in martial arts, and working as a driver for a local minicab firm. What sets Matt apart is his extraordinary medical condition. Tourette syndrome, a nervous disorder that manifests itself in uncontrollable tics, vocalizations, and stuttered speech. I'm the one, the one, the one, the one, the one, the one second person in the under 16 modern. Yeah, it's great, I had a really good time. Matt's condition was only diagnosed 10 years ago but he's always been determined to try and live as normal a life as possible. Well, living with Tourette's has been a challenge, to say the least, but, but I mean, but, I mean it's, been, it's been an invaluable experience as well, in a way, because in some ways I feel as though if I didn't have Tourette's, I wouldn't be the person I am now, and I wouldn't know as much as I do now. When I'm driving the taxi, I just, I mean, I just switch off. I mean, I mean, sometimes I, I do have outbursts when I just dropped customer off. I feel like I want to tame Tourette's because, I mean, for the past a few years, life has been, I suppose you could say, thoroughly miserable because of the um, bullying at school and so forth. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, life hasn't been exactly a bowl of peaches for me for the past few years. A 45-minute lesson, if he could last five minutes, that would be it. So the rest of the 40 minutes, he was disruptive, and that's what was, that's what sort of came out, wasn't mm. it? That's how it went. It just got worse, didn't it, for him? Matt still haunted by a particular incident at school, when a teacher singled him out in assembly. He just said to me in front of 485 students, was the guy in the second row from the back, please stop ticking, you're embarrassing me. And every head turned and every head laughed. And that made, and that made me feel as though, I mean, should I, I mean, should I really be here? Do I deserve to be here? And at that age, he got depressed very, very quickly. The bullying got so bad that at one stage, uh, towards the end of year nine, I was seriously thinking of walking up to the roof of one of the buildings. I was jumping off, I just couldn't take the physical and emotional stress anymore. I mean, um, yeah. When I, mean, when I have an outburst, um, I, can feel, I can feel the urge building up inside me for a couple of minutes, but, but when I finally let go, it, in the two or three seconds it lasts, when I'm having the outburst, it feels, it feels brilliant because I'm releasing some of the tension that's, that's building up inside me. The characteristic of the tick is that the person feels compelled to perform the behaviour and they can resist it or suppress it at the expense of internal tension, but eventually they have to perform the behaviour. And sometimes that behaviour is a noise. He was out on the train the other week, 
and he had a very loud tick. And this young girl just burst into tears. She was scared. She she ran down the carriage screaming. And do you know what my mother said to me? She said, she said, I mean, I mean, if you can't control yourself, if you can't control yourself, you, I mean, you, you should not be here. Despite such daily setbacks, he's determined to try and forge a career in the arts. He's been coming to stage work since he was 10 to our summer schools. He's gradually built up relationships and a lot of the, particularly the girls here. Um, I mean, he's quite a good looking chap too, isn't he? <laughs> so he's quite popular. <laughs> On occasion, um, Tourette's does, you know, cause a problem in the fact that we have to spend quite a lot of time motivational procedures with Matt to just make him feel that he can achieve. I just, I mean, I mean, one thing, I mean, one thing about me is I am absolutely scared rigid of success. Dancing alongside his martial arts skills um, basically focus what he's doing and also give him confidence. He needs the confidence. He feels very low in himself on occasions. If something's going really well, I will automatically do something to fail it because, because again, in some ways, I don't feel I deserve to be successful. I mean, I, 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 I mean, again, one thing Tourette's does to you is, is it does give you very low self-esteem and no self-belief. I've always had that problem. He's got all sorts of ambitions. He wants to act, he wants to do a bit of modelling. But at the moment, the way he is, he wouldn't get through a casting because his tics are so, um, so large and noisy. There's two things we want him to be able to overcome. One is his, his self-doubt and the other is to find a way of dealing with his tics. Ideally, uh, I, I, mean, I mean, I know I can't completely get rid of, I, know I can't completely eradicate my speech problem, but I mean, you know, but, you know, but I mean, I'd like to learn some techniques to cope better with my speech. I have no idea what or how, but we are. I just believe that the, uh, the mind is the most amazing piece of kit and there are people who are able to do things with it. I'm hoping the Paul is one of them. Having read Matt's case notes, Paul calls him to assess the severity of his condition. Hello, is that Matthew? It is, yes. Hi, Matthew. It's Paul McKenna speaking. Oh, good afternoon, sir. How are Hello. you? Hello. Yeah, very good, thanks. Um, so, <coughs> I've been reading your, your case history, um, and you had Tourette since you were about 10. Or well, that's uh, when you were diagnosed with it. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. And it manifests as motor tics, yeah. and, and also some, some auditory um, expressions as well, yeah? Exactly, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. okay. And, and um, do you find that it's worse when you're under <coughs> stress? So, big one? Do you find that it's worse when you're under stress? Yes, for that adapt it is, yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, I mean, there's a couple of things that, because I've worked with people with Tourette's before, and certainly um, what they have found is that by using some of the stress control techniques that I'm able to teach them, they were able to reduce the symptoms at times when perhaps they would have been worse. Okay. Um, so, would you be up for trying some of those things? I'll be, I'll be more than happy to do so, yes. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, let's just try a couple of things. Paul guides Matt through a number of procedures in an effort to identify which techniques will work best for him. Very, very good. Okay. Um, what I would be particularly interested in is seeing the, if, seeing the effects. I look forward to seeing you in a few days. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. I think I can help Matthew uh, reduce the symptoms of the Tourette's so that, that they become less frequent, maybe not so severe. but. What I'm absolutely certain I can help him with is to feel better in himself about this generally. I, 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 one thing Paul did say to me was, hey, I'm, I'm Matt, I have Tourette's, this is a special part of me, it is me. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, I have looked at this in that way before, but I've never quite believed it, and now, and now I do believe it. Matt arrives in London to meet Paul face to face. I'm a bit apprehensive about meeting Paul for the first time I'm but I mean, even though he has had a very high success rate with previous cases, I'm not sure what he can do for Tourette's, but it will be interesting to see um, me after the, after the treatment as, as opposed to now, I suppose. But, I mean, um, but, but, I mean, but in the past I've been too scared to accept help because I used to see it as a failure. I, 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 mean, I mean, I just thought the best way to cope with it was to soldier on by myself. Tourette's is a chemical imbalance in the brain which produces uh, motor tics, which are twitches, uh, or v vocal tics, which are um, noises, usually in the form of profanities, uh, uh, which happen involuntarily. And uh, this is made worse when the person is under stress. Stress is a neurophysiological state. 
Um, what I'm going to do with Matt is I'm going to create a neurophysiological state of relaxation. I'm then going to stress him and fire off the relaxation. So I'm going to, what we can have is stress and relaxation happening simultaneously and one will cancel out the other, which, will inf uh, which won't cure him, but uh, will bring a uh, greater uh, emotional equilibrium to his life, which means that as a result he should have less of the Tourette's symptoms. Come this way, Matt. Have a seat. How are you doing? I'm fine again. How are you? How are you? Yeah, good. So what, what I'd like to do, first of all, is literally rehearse um, a state of relaxation. Okay. Yeah? So we're going to do this through visualization because right. the mind and body are intimately linked. You know, if you think of something scary and, you know, imagine it intensely enough, the nervous system can't tell the difference between a real and a vividly imagined experience. What we'll do is I want to create a slider here. Yeah, so, um, and it'll be numbered one to five. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. you know, first stage is one, second stage two, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Three, four, five, yeah, that's four, right. Five. First of all, you need to sit in a position which is kind of comfortable. And then just close your eyes and relax inside. And any, if there are any twitches, it does, it's fine. It doesn't matter at all. And from this place, I'd like you to imagine how you would look if you were twice as relaxed as you are right now. And float into that more relaxed you see through the eyes of your more relaxed self hear through the ears and feel the greater relaxation bring the slider back up six to five five to four four to three coming back two move the slider up to one and wide awake Tell me how you felt when you were doing that. When I was relaxed, I felt a lot more in control of myself than I have done for, mm. for quite a while. It felt sublime, mm. if I'm perfectly honest. Yeah, good. Okay, this is really nice. That's what we want to be able to do today, is to, te to, to train your neurology and physiology to change states dramatically, yeah. to go from <gasps> to ah. And what will happen is, when we feel the stress coming, we can go and iron it out. Iron it out. Iron it Having out. spent 40 minutes on relaxation, Paul now moves on to a new technique. Um, this, this tapping technique, now this definitely produces more serotonin, yeah? But um, it's very good for compulsion and for stress and trauma. In fact, the number one choice of trauma treatment in Kosovo is developed by a brilliant American scientist. And uh, I know it looks a bit weird, but it works really well. So I want you to think about an activity, uh, something that you find very stressful. Driving a car with, pass with a passenger in the back who's... I wouldn't say weird, but he just gives off a vibe of being, well, I wouldn't say untrustworthy, but the closest thing to So on a scale of 1 to 10, where's the stress level for that? I'd say about 7. Yeah, great. Right. Let's concentrate on that feeling while we do this. Run it now. Concentrate on that feeling. This tapping technique is called TFT, stands for Thought Field Therapy. And in an area of the brain called the amygdala is stored in the proteins a code, like a computer code, for compulsion and stress and trauma. And what this does is, while we think about what's stressful and tap simultaneously, is it reorganizes the way the code uh, is written in that area of the brain. So it's, it's like overwriting the operating software of the brain. Show me, what's the thing that you do? Is it you, you go like that, is it? Yeah, can you show me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying, I just can't do it. You can't do it? I just can't do but it. Try harder. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. In just two hours, so much has been achieved. I think that worked very well uh, because um, part of what's driving the symptoms of the Tourette's is the stress. When I was able to reduce the stress, I'm changing uh, the, the, the brain and body chemistry um, and, and there's less symptoms. It was one of the most liberating experiences I've ever had. I mean, before I went in, I was very nervous. I wasn't sure what I was going to expect. But now I've come out, I just feel so much happier as a person. I feel absolutely brilliant. We saw changes, significant changes happen within the room. If you can get them to happen in the room, you can get them to happen in life. So I foresee that not only will he have less to rest symptoms, uh, but also he'll, in place of that, become more confident and more optimistic, more outgoing, and, and, and get a better quality of life. I'm hoping to put the issue of Tourette's behind me. I mean, I know it's played a, a, re a, a very prominent part in my life so far, but I hope just to throw that all away and start fresh. If I do have a tick outburst, I won't feel ashamed to have the outburst. I'll just pass it off as if it was absolutely nothing.
Two weeks later, and it doesn't get more stressful than this. Matt's about to read for one of Britain's top casting directors, Esther Charkham, whose credits include Chariots of Fire and Quadrophenia. It makes me feel dizzy, giddy. You smell brand new. You look brand new, all of you. The soft little hairs on your arms. But it's mostly your lips. I love your lips. That's why I've, I've always wanted to kiss you, ever since 3B. Just a kiss, not the other things. I don't want to do the other things, do you? Oh, well done. Well done. Matt, I really think that you should go to drama school. I really do. I think three years in a really good drama school would do the world of good. It would boost your confidence. I think you've got a, as good a chance as anybody else who is as good as you are. Mm. And I think you're good. Mm. I really do. It's been an amazing couple of weeks for Matt and his parents. When I saw Matt after he'd seen Paul, it wasn't the way he was acting, it was just his voice. His voice was a lot calmer, he seemed just very much cooler. It was really quite noticeable. I feel that I, I'm in complete control of myself. I know what I can do and what I can't do. I know what I shouldn't do and it feels absolutely brilliant. It's given him some confidence and he realises that king, things can be different. He's seen that and that's a, good, that's a good basis on which to build and go forward. I feel as though I can, I can be completely myself and if somebody doesn't like it, then that's their problem. I just feel, I feel so much happier about life and about myself. I, f I feel like a completely new person. Paul's treatment helped Matt reduce his tics and vocal outbursts by 80%. Matt is now pursuing with new confidence his passion to work in the arts. Coming up, Paul sets out to mend ex-model Lizzie's broken heart that's been shattered by her ex-love. And will former needle-phobic Dr. Celia Batley finally be able to take blood? Anyone who's ever waited by the phone for a boyfriend to call or driven past an ex's house late at night to see who they're with can relate to the obsessiveness one feels at the end of a relationship. You can get in the back. 18 months ago, Liz's partner of 12 years left her and she's tortured daily by his absence. He's been so cruel to me and I just, just still miss him so much. <laughs> I've had a really bad night, by the way. I've had about three hours sleep. A bit of a night and just can't get back to sleep. My mind's going 50... I mean, if you think about it, this is, my mind's been thinking of the exact same thing. I mean, 900 days. It's just stupid. 900 days and nights of agony. Everything goes through my mind. Like, it's, it's, like it's free-falling out of control. It's like someone is physically sticking a knife in my heart and twisting it and twisting it and twisting it and they're not taking the knife out and they're not giving up on twisting the knife. Um, I mean, are you still in love with them? Yeah. Obsessed, I should think, really. <laughs> you have no control when you're obsessed, do you? I mean, I, I thought, right, I want to find out what he's up to, so I got a private investigator. And um, cost me a fortune, and they, well, they took, took my week to track him down. And they said, "Well, are you sitting down? I've got some really bad news." 
And he's with this bird in Egham. And uh, she was 45 then, so she'll be 47 now. That hurt, being older. And she was blonde. <laughs> so I started bleaching my hair. <laughs> oh, God, which didn't suit me at all. I want to be set free from thinking about this man. I'm obsessed by him. It's not good. It's not good for my son. It's not good for me. I, I mean, I, lo I used to play golf all the time. I used to just run, and jog, and go to the gym. And now I'm just a vegetable. I'm an absolute vegetable. <sighs> I try and put them out. And a lot of friends have given up on me. There we go. Already, <laughs> probably can go home now. <laughs> Lizzie's suffering from love pain. Uh, this is something that just about every human being in their lifetime um, has happened to them. Uh, the breakup of a relationship, um, or so when somebody dies. Um, it works like this. Um, our emotions are part of our experience of living. They, they, are, they signal to us when we need to pay attention to something. Now, if somebody goes, somebody that we love, it's understandable we should feel upset because the relationship meant something to us. Now, within every human being, there is a mechanism for that to, within the course of time, to dissipate. Um, some people are over it really quickly and other people take longer. Uh, generally it comes down to the amount of future that you've invested in your mind with respect to that person. If you thought, this is the one, I'm going to be with them, everything's going to be fine, and suddenly they go, oh, by the way, I'm off. It, it's, um, it's really tough. Um, and it's often made worse when that person leaves by saying, the reason I'm going is because of this and this and this and this. And the you know, person ends up playing all of the you know, supposedly terrible things that they did over and over in their mind. So what happens is the person leaving puts them in the shock by telling them they're off and then gives them a list of why. And all of those things go in with the power of hypnotic suggestion. As I suspected with Lizzie, um, there are two issues here. One which I can absolutely help her with straight away, which is to take the overwhelm out of this situation and of the obsessive thinking, yeah? As for forming more functional relationships in the future, that's not really my area of expertise. In fact, I should try and form one myself. In her modeling career, Lizzie's looks were a definite plus, but she feels they may have worked against her in her relationships. I know it's nice to be nice looking, but I have to say, hand on heart, I think it's been my down, downfall because all the men I've met have been like playboys, all of them, and you know they, I've gone along with them because you know, I'm a figure in my face, or I can get you know she looks nice and you know nice to have on my side. If I didn't have the look so much, um, I think I probably would have been happier because then it's not such a superficial pretend relationship face value you know it's more like I love you for what you are and I'm sure that's true and I've never had that sort of relationship these disastrous relationships have taken their toll on Lizzie's self-esteem don't like myself at all no. I try to but no I get embarrassed by myself a lot I don't like what I've done I don't I always seem to be putting my foot in it. No, I don't, I don't like myself at all, no. I think that's probably why I go with these men. <laughs> and of course they compound it. They compound my um, feeling about myself. Come on, you two. I'm so scared. I am so scared of getting involved with someone because I do not, absolutely not, if I get better, I do not want to get like this ever, ever again. This is a living nightmare. Hey, good boys. I mean, I had a great job and it took a long time to get to where I was, but no way I'll go back to it now. I mean, my, my emotions are like a graph because every day, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to wake up to. I might be an emotional wreck or I might be okay. It's too dodgy to risk. Oh, God. I'm just annoyed that I'm, I produce myself for a pitiful low self esteem that's affecting everything around me. I do, I'd like to be happy with myself. And then if someone came along, that would be an added bonus, so if they went, I wouldn't fall apart. That's what I'd like to get to, and then I can work and get back into work and do something maybe that I want to do. For the last 18 months, 
heartbroken Lizzie has wept uncontrollably and endured nights of haunting insomnia. Conventional therapies have had no impact. She's completely at the end of her tether. Paul McKenna is her last hope. Who's the, um, who's the guy? Uh, it's my ex-partner I've had been with for, well, nearly 12 years. Nearly 12 years. Old son. Yeah. When you were imagining uh, this guy off um, having fun, you know, with other women and enjoying himself while you feel um, uh, heartbroken and you think to yourself, it's just not fair, and you do that over and over again, you keep yourself stuck there. You actually, you get good at what you practice. That's exactly what's happened. Yeah. It's got worse than worse. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you to go and get four times when he was not good enough. Okay. Yeah? <clears throat> and we're going to run them over and over and over and over again. But I, but I want them to be strong ones, yeah? Oh. Times when you thought, when you, were, when you felt negative towards him, when, when he wasn't good enough, when you wanted to get away from him. For the first two incidents, Lizzie remembers a couple of terrible arguments when they were out together. Okay, so we've got Ascot, we've got Dover Street. Yeah. Give me number three. Mm. Was there a time he just looked like an ugly bastard? <laughs> When he was overweight, yeah. Excellent. There we go. Yeah. Make him, yeah, go back and remember that. We'll call him uh, Fatty. Number four. <laughs> fatty. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, God. Number four. Number four. Another time he's not good enough. He just was not up to the job and you were, like, revolted by him. Or, you know what? Let's pick one of those times he was unfaithful to you. Oh. What we're going to do is we're going to see them in full, vivid colour. And it means you'll need to feel some discomfort before you feel better. Okay. Yeah, it's all right, because once we've done this, it's never the same again. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through these four again and again and again and again. But we're going to start off slowly, and then we're going to get faster and faster, and then we're going to make them overlap. So Ascot will run into Dover Street, will run into Fatty, will run into Unfaithful, until it almost feels like they're all happening at once. Ooh. And at that point, it'll be so... Oh, no, no, it won't, no, it's not what you think. It'll be so overwhelmingly <laughs> negative. At that moment, I want you to think of the most lovey-dovey time you ever had with this guy. And that will collapse the old addiction out. Okay. Yeah, it's very cool. Okay. Jump into the first one, okay. ask it. See what you saw, hear what you heard, mm. and feel how you felt. Yeah. Okay. And then jump into fatty time. See what you saw, hear what you heard, feel how you felt at the time. Ascot, Dover Street, Fatty, Unfaithful, Ascot, Dover Street, Fatty, Unfaithful, Ascot, Dover Street, Fatty, Unfaithful, Ascot, D Dover Street, Fatty, Unfaithful. Now, look at that lovey-dovey picture. Think about him now. What's the difference? Do you love this guy? No. you want to be with this guy? No. But think about this, this woman, this lucky, lucky woman that's got him. She's got all of those lovely traits to look forward to. Oh, no. Not worth it. No. You sure? But yeah, I'm no. absolutely 100%. But do you not miss him? What's he doing? You're not wondering about what he's doing now? No, because I've got better things to do, I think. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Have you ever done any hypnosis before? No. Not okay. Really. Now, it's not like um, you're under an anaesthetic. And when you Having dealt with her obsession, Paul starts to tackle her low self esteem. Paul's recording the hypnosis for her to listen to every day to reinforce the changes. Think about somebody who you know loves and respects you. Imagine them standing in front of you now. Float into them and look at yourself through their eyes. See the things in you that they love and respect that perhaps you hadn't noticed until now. And then float back into yourself and take all those good feelings with you. Wow. Gosh. Feel good? Yeah. It's like a burden's lifted, isn't it? Cleansed. Mm -hmm. It is. Like a wave has washed over me. Mm. I feel amazing, actually. Mm. Mind you, do you know what? You look younger. <laughs> you look you look younger, you look more attractive, you yeah. look more open. You, your whole energy is different. Uh, mm. I just feel the weight mm. has literally lifted. Mm. I also feel right now, I feel like I want to go out and party. Yeah. I, I don't know, I want to go out and meet yeah. a group of friends yeah. and just feel, be there for the minute. Yeah. Not think, oh, mm. I'm going there, but my mm. mind is elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. <sighs> I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. I'm free. <sighs> free. 
three weeks on at the Windsor races and Lizzie's a different woman. I feel quite happy that I can be happy on my own rather than rely on someone else. So if they do come into my life, um, as they have done and gone out of my life, but I don't feel that that's going to ruin everything else and dictate to me how I'm going to live my life. When Paul first met Lizzie, she thought about her ex every two minutes. Now she finally believes she's over him. I feel more in control. I don't have to, you know, I don't have all those negative thoughts and those bad memories. They seem to be not erased, but they don't mean anything to me. I said it's just more indifference to me now. Since meeting Paul, Celia's life has changed dramatically. I bought this car about a week after I first saw Paul. I've always liked convertibles, but obviously with my phobia, I was always... I always felt very vulnerable with the, the roof down and I, I actually sort of imagined people come up and, and stab me with needles while I was driving around. And uh, I just don't feel that's an issue anymore, it's not a problem, so I can have the car I want. And then sometimes I think maybe I've sat around being a victim for too long and Paul's just shown me another way. I'm no longer a victim and I can actually live, live life to the full. Paul is confident Celia is cured. But there's one final hurdle he wanted to overcome. So last time, a bit reluctant at first, you drew some blood from me, but you were fine. You held, uh, you held the swab as well. You know, you were you were cool with it by the end. But uh, we didn't actually get to taking a blood sample. Thank God. But um, is that something you think you could do now? Yeah, I actually feel like I'd like to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Paul hopes that Celia will now be able to demonstrate that she is cured of her ten-year-old needle phobia. It won't hurt. Yeah. Much. It's alright. As soon as you got enough, stop. <laughs> My God, you just took blood from me. That's fantastic. So it's, oh yeah. So it's ten years since you did that, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you did that very confidently, I thought. So you see, I think you're cured. If you can do that, what do you think? I do feel completely different. You know, like you said earlier, I wish I'd done this. Eons ago. Not only did she take blood from me today, which would be something that would have been impossible for a few days ago, but she did it very confidently. And I mean, I could tell because she was doing it, I felt confident. But there were so many other delightful things that I could see about Celia. She's just, she opened up. Taking the blood today was, it, it just felt like I was transported back over 10 years. I was just at work and just taking blood as I um, and didn't really think about it at all. That was amazing. I think we're going to see some great things in Celia's future. I think she's undoubtedly going to be a happier, more motivated, more confident person. I feel it's just unleashed a whole new me, and I'm just ready to go out there and start living my life. One month on, and Celia's having acupuncture. She's now doing voluntary work at a cancer clinic and hopes to return to medicine and resume her career as a doctor. Next week, Paul meets Ray to try and restore his sight after eight years. Can he cure diabetic Sharon of her sugar addiction and tempers flare as he tackles road rage? Fuck off! <laughs>